Prasad, and this is my Leukemia Gene Expression Project, or machine learning. Um, so I chose this project because I was interested in learning about leukemia gene expression and to possibly create a model that could accurately predict cancerous versus normal tissue depending on gene expression. I also was curious to see which genes would be predicted to be the most significant in gene expression of leukemia. Um, I'm so sorry, I have concussion, so please forgive me if I uh, misspeak a little bit. Um, but to start, my question was, can you distinguish cancerous tissues from normal tissue? And if so, which genes are important for distinguishing the two? Um, my hypothesis, or I guess prediction, was I do believe that it's possible to distinguish cancerous tissues from normal tissues and creating a model that can do so. Um, and using that model, I think we can also find specific genes that are predictors or like biomarkers that can be helpful in the future for diagnostic tools. Um, so for the research or the background, acute myeloid leukemia is an acute blood cancer that starts in your bone marrow. Um, it develops as a result of genetic changes in the hem hematopoietic precursor cell, which results in accumulation of immature myeloid cells in the bone marrow and peripheral blood. This mutation occurs in both oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. It can be caused by a variety of genes. I wanted to create a model that could differentiate between normal and cancerous tissues and potentially be used to predict biomarkers related to acute myeloid uh, leukemia. And this is by doing or by using machine learning techniques. Uh, this predictive model could be used to distinguish these types. Uh, for the data set that I used, I actually used uh, uh, it had cancer tissue, which was referred to as AML, and then the normal tissue is broken into a few different classes, peripheral blood, blood marrow, and then CDK34+, plus, which is a um, well-known embryonic cell, uh, cell line, and that's specifically broken uh, further into peripheral blood and bone marrow, and I will be discussing that more in the next slide, actually. Oh, sorry, the slide after that. Um, so my testing method, so I actually started with data visualization. I did a heat map. I also checked distribution of the classes in the data. I also did um, PCA to conduct, or was conducted to see how much variance was explained. I also combined the two subclasses of CDK34+, plus to see how it affected the PCA and grouping, um, which we'll see like later on in the slideshow. Before using a classification method, I also used lazy predict to determine the best model from this, I saw that random forest was the best model, which is a bit of a spoiler, um, and I used that to model the data. Uh, next, I did feature selection, which was to identify the top genes that were um, the top genes that were used in the random forest classification model, and then also those were the potential biomarkers with that classification system. Uh, I ended with autoencoders just to explain the variance a little bit better and for dimensionality reduction, and to get a better view of the data overall. So just to kind of start, uh, this is my heat map of the data. Um, from this, you can kind of see a few different things. The first thing that you'll notice is that um, the, uh, the there are actual like differences in the expression of each of the genes. If you look at the lines, I know it's a little bit small and it's just because there are a lot of like uh, genes used in this. Um, uh, so sorry, I don't know what's going on with my mouse, but that's kind of basically all that there is. It's really just that there are um, like differences in gene expression between all the genes and it's consistent between some of the samples and some of the genes like they appear to be more in a straight line which you can kind of see. I don't know if you can see my mouse but you can kind of see it around here and then there's others that are a little bit more kind of like spread out. There's less consistent expression levels. Uh, there's like dotted lines or chunks of different colors in one of the like straight columns or bands. For example right around here you can see it goes like lighter and then goes to a dark uh, indicating less expression and then lighter and then it keeps going like that where it's kind of broken up into chunks like that. Uh, next we have the PCA plot. So with this PCA plot, this is the plot that actually has all of the subclasses on it. So uh, we see the plot that all the normal tissue is nicely clustered together and so is the cancer tissue. Uh, although it's spread out like the cancer tissue itself, the AML, which is the red dots, is spread out a little bit more throughout the plot. However, only 34% of the variance is explained, um, and I actually did calculate how many PCA components are need to, needed to explain 80% of the variance, which is the threshold usually, and it's 22 components. Um, there is still some nice uh, clustering or grouping, I guess, that's being done, but I, I did think it would be best to do autoencoders just to kind of explain that variance a little bit better. Um, as you can see, the, the peripheral blood is kind of cluster, grouped up here. The, the pink is the bone marrow group. The dark blue is the bone marrow CD34. And then the dark green is the PBSC, which is the peripheral blood for the CDK34 cells. And then the red is the leukemia cells. Or sorry, the cancerous tissue, I should say. Uh, and then this is the updated PCA. I actually ended up 
kind of after doing a distribution, I noticed that there was a difference of samples between the AML samples and then the different subclasses of the normal samples. So I decided to combine the two different categories of CD34 cells into one variable with both, just to kind of see what would happen. I was just a little bit curious. And additionally, I, I also thought CD34K shell cells could be one general category, as I wasn't as interested in looking at them, to be honest. Um, but I also just wanted to kind of see what would happen. Uh, the variance is still ends up being around 34%. That's being explained anyways. There wasn't really too much of a difference in the plot. Um, and there's still like 22 components that need it, are needed to explain 80% of the variance. Uh, there's still like some pretty nice clustering, just different colors, of course. So we still have the peripheral blood up here. The leukemia is still kind of spread out throughout the thing or throughout the plot, I mean. The bone marrow is now split um, here and then a little bit up here, which is a little bit interesting. And the CD34 is kind of just in the middle between the bone marrow groups. Um, but yeah, I just, I, this was just a little experiment. And then I went back to manipulating the original data after that. And I actually did lazy predict. Um, so with lazy predict, it's a way to kind of see the best classification method. It's running a different, a ton of different classification methods. And you can kind of compare it based off of the um, parameters that's given accuracy, balance, accuracy, F1 score, and then the time taken. So from this model, this is the top 10. I noticed that random force is on that, and that is one of the classifier methods that we talked about in class. So I just chose to use that. We also can just tell for the parameters for all of them. They're pretty well, or pretty good, I should say. Um, ignoring time taken for the other three. If it's closer to one, it's better. Um, time taken, you don't want a classification method that's going to take an extremely long period of time. So the first one where it's LG uh, BM classifier, even though all the values or all the other parameters are the highest, that time taken is definitely a detraction. It's not something that you should do. Um, so we can kind of, also, it's not a model we really talked about in class, so I just ignored that. Um, I did see random forest though, and I thought that was interesting and wanted to try it. And also the parameters for that were pretty high still. Um, time taken was a little bit higher than some of the other ones, but not too big of a deal compared to the, like the first model having such a large time taken. So like I said, I did random forest. Uh, this is the classification report that was done. Uh, I used a test sample or test size of about 25%. Um, and when I actually did it, I got 100% accuracy with the model, um, which I thought was pretty cool. For the classification report, just for some background precision is the ratio of true positives to total positives and essentially refers to accuracy. So a higher precision score is going indica to indicate a lower rate of false positives. Recall is the ratio of true positives to all the actual observations. So a total true positives and false, so, the, so sorry, so the true or the total of the true positives and false negatives, and essentially refers to sensitivity of the model. The F1 score is the weighted average of precision and recall, so it takes the false positives and false negatives into account. Uh, F1 score is one of the most param or most uh, important parameters, as it can be more useful than precision, just because it's taking into account false positives and false negatives. And then support is the number of occurrences with each class, so for this it's not as important. We see that all the parameters except support are one for each of the types of tissues, so this classification method worked really well. Um, but yeah, uh, here's a heat map that kind of visually shows this. We see that for all of them, it's uh, the model accuracy at the top. I have a little screenshot. It is one or 100%. And you can see in the confusion matrix, all of the um, samples were classified properly and where it should be, which was great to see. Um, and this is using the original data set, not that one that I combined. So next I did feature selection. Ooh. So uh, this was kind of interesting when I did feature selection. I looked at the top um, five uh, genes from this, and you can see the top five significant genes. I have like the name that they have, but I also actually ended up looking them up just to kind of get the official gene name. So those genes in order correspond to MYH10, PCDH9, TSPYL5, CD79A, and CCNA1. Just for some background, MYH10 encodes myrosin, which is an important for cytokinesis, which is an important part of the cell cycle that gets dysregulated with cancer because usually cell cycle um, it, with cytokinesis, it's the breaking apart when the cells are being formed. And there's actually issues with cell proliferation in uh, patients who have AML. Uh, PCDH9 encodes a protocadhedron, which is important for cell adhesion in neuronal cell tissues and signaling at neuronal synaptic junctions. This one was the most interesting to me just because I didn't really see as much of a link to AML with this one. Um, I'm sure I probably missed something um, that is a little bit more clear to doctors or people more well-versed with oncology, um, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. TSPYL5 is involved in modulation of cell growth and involved in regulation of P53, which is a very crucial tumor suppressor gene. So I thought that was also pretty fascinating. 
CD79A is a protein coding gene involved in B lymphocyte antigen receptors, which is important in the immune system response, and it has also been found to be upregulated in cancer patients. And then finally, CCNA1 is, encodes cyclins that are important for cy cell cycle regulation. They're really crucial for that, and it's something that gets dysregulated in cancer. And so looking at those top five genes, the CCNA1 gene uh, was found, also found to be in the associated publication to be related to AML-specific expression changes. So that was pretty interesting because that indicates it's definitely a, a good biomarker for differentiating between cancerous tissues and normal tissues just because it is associated with AML-specific expression changes. So that was the first interesting thing I saw. Uh, the next thing I did was autoencoders, which um, basically with the autoencoders, I was kind of just trying to understand. Um, oh, well, here's the graph. I should probably start off with that first. Uh, but basically, you can see from the above graphs that the first one I did was 50 features, and the next one I did was 100 features. You see that the 100 features results in 75% of the variance explained. And it also has um, a much better um, MAE, essentially. So with this, you see uh, that the there's a drop with the epochs down to about 40, as in both of the graphs, like regardless of the number of features, the mean absolute error was low for both those training and testing data. And we want that training and testing data to have like similar low values, um, just because that means the mean error is the lowest there. Uh, so we also see looking at the PCA plot, we see some nice grouping for all the classes again. But it's really um, good that the PCA plots with the 100 features is now explaining 75% of the variance, which is much closer to that threshold of 80% that I was talking about. And here's kind of my explanation for that that I just kind of went through anyways. Um, but like I said, we see from that, those graphs that 100 features results in 75% variance explained. That's closer to the 80% threshold. And then 100 features is better for explaining the variance. And you can drop down the amount of epochs down to around 40 just because it, it results in a lower um, mean absolute error. So my discoveries. Uh, so basically, I, I noticed a few interesting things, actually. So the first thing is that random forest classification produced a model with 100% accuracy with a small test size. So it, it shows that the accuracy is not due to overfitting by using a larger test size, which is pretty nice, at least. Um, the autoencoders explained 75% of the variance, which was much more than was explained originally with just the PCA plots, which was about 34%. It's also much closer to that threshold of 80%. And then feature selection showed some of the uh, more significant gene that actually picked out one that was was, was related to AML-specific expression changes and was found in a publication to be that way. Um, this was pretty interesting because my question originally was, can you distinguish cancerous tissues from normal tissue? And if so, which gene are important for distinguishing? You are able to create a model that could accurately classify cancerous and normal tissues using gene expression data. And it also did pick out the top five genes that could be biomarkers. Those genes specifically were fascinating just because they're all, to some extent, involved in the cell cycle or immune system, and those both affect the spread of cancer and regulation of cancer. So that means that they could actually be some pretty interesting biomarkers to further explore, especially because finding CCNA1 as significant in the classification method as it was also significant in the publication, it kind of validates the fact that it's very important for differentiating differentiating tissue types. Um, overall, looks like random forest is a good modeling choice if, there looks, uh, if looking to differentiate between the tissue types, but the variance isn't explained as well, so you kind of need to supplement with autoencoders. And then those five significant genes that I was talking about should really be further explored. Like I said, takeaway machine learning models can be used to fairly accurately predict cancers versus non-cancerous tissues with regard to ML and have been or can be used to identify potential new biomarkers that could be used diagnostically. The conclusion, like I said, random forest is an accurate classification method for this data set, can be used to predict tissue differentiation, um, not enough variance is explained by PCA, so autoencoders is used as a supplement to kind of explain more of the variance, uh, and then feature selection is important for finding those biomarkers slash genes that, are, um, that can be further explored. What can be done next? Uh, like I said, further exploration of those genes picked up by random forest to see if they could be used by biomarkers. And if there are any other significant and other classification methods would be pretty interesting to look at, just because those genes are all already involved with cancer and uh, the immune system and cell regulation, that it's definitely a fascinating topic to look into because they might be more involved in the future. Um, it could be pretty useful if they are uh, discovered to be involved in other 
data sets, I guess, um, with more data, bigger data, I would say, then you might actually be able to use it as a diagnostic method and a diagnostic tool, add it to a genetic testing panel um, when you're testing to see if a patient could be um, more at risk for having cancer, uh, specifically AML, in this scenario. That's about it. Uh, this is my references. Uh, thank you for your time. And I apologize if I didn't make sense at any point. I'm suffering from a concussion at the moment. Um, but thank you.